the average nine to fiver gets 20 paid time, paid time off days per year, 20 days. Like how much happier, healthier of a human being would you be if you got 20 days a month of working paid time off? True, true. You, yeah. you wonder why our industry, why we're all just like so burnt out to the point of like walking off a job. It's not because we're more irresponsible. It's not because we are moral or ambition failures. It's because our jobs are set up in a very unique way where these benefits are not there. And unfortunately, we have to create them for ourselves. Hi, welcome to the Modern Waiter Podcast. I'm Marlon Joseph, the Modern Waiter, where we discuss all things restaurant business. Learn something, laugh at something. <laughs> On today's episode, we are joined by Barbara Sloan, the author of Tipped, a very important book for service industry employees who are often left out of the common wealth building practices. Let's change the service industry together. But first, the intro. I'm tired of working deadbeat jobs for lame pay. I'm tired of getting fired and hired the same day. If you know the rules of the game, then you'll stay. And if you don't, then you'll be a part. As usual, I'm joined by my good friend, Danny DeVilla. What's up, what's up, what's up? Now, before we start the show, I'd like to thank you all who listen to us, who are watching us right now. We are now on YouTube. Thank you so much for... Uh, supporting us another way that you can support us if you do enjoy this content give us a like do consider subscribing because we do this for you each and every week now let's uh let's get right into it thank you so much barbara thank you for joining us oh, i'm so excited to be here guys thanks for having me before we get into the how i really would like to talk about the why tell me tell me about your early years, you've you've been in the industry, you've been in the restaurant industry. Yeah, I've been in this industry for 20 years. Um, I kind of don't count this in my years, but one of my first tip jobs was um, as a paper girl. I had a paper route outside of Detroit. Uh, I had a couple blocks, but I remember, I remember around the holidays, we would get like dollars or even $5 tips. And mm -hmm. I remember feeling super, super rich. And then when I was in high school, I worked at, um, I'm not sure if you guys have this restaurant, but it's called an A&W. It's, um, we, you remember like the little roller skating waitresses that would go and deliver you either like a root beer or a hot dog and- Very yeah, happy so, days-ish. Very, very happy days-ish. <laughs> Although they really need to repave that concrete. Uh, <laughs> you have to be light on your feet. <laughs> exactly. So that was like one of my other first experiences. And then, when I was 19, um, my dad passed away, and if you've ever lost a parent, you know that it just makes life, it, it, it reminds you that life is precious. And so um, I wanted to buy the house that I lived in and restore it, so I ended up, this is 2003, 2000, yeah, 2003. So if okay. you know what was happening with mortgages, they would give them to anybody at that point. And so I ended up taking out a mortgage for twice the price of the value of the home. Wow. maxing out 10 credit cards to like renovate the house myself. I just, I put myself in a really bad financial position just trying to like work through my grief as a 19 year old person. And when I came up for air, I just remember realizing I needed to get myself out of that situation. Like I just couldn't handle it anymore. And so I moved, I sold the house, I moved to California and I started working in the service industry. I started waiting tables, bartending. Um, and so while I was in California, I worked at restaurants, bars, clubs. I was answering ads on Craigslist for random gigs. This was before you would get murdered on Craigslist. Uh, <laughs> but, but I would do all of these like random gigs. Like I would do cater waitering and just show up at somebody's home or somebody's backyard party or some sort of like a, in a you know film event um, to help out. And then I moved to Las Vegas where I was a uh, a flair bartender, I was a sideshow showgirl, I worked at dive bars, I worked on the strip, um, I worked in, I moved to Boston, I worked in Fenway Park, I lived in New York, I was a coyote, so I've, I've moved Ooh. all around the country, oh, wow. I've done a lot of different types of jobs, um, but yeah, that's that's my background. I have not been a hairstylist or a taxi driver, but if it's involved, <laughs> if it's involved tips, most likely I've done it. <laughs> 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 and I learned so much like I, you know i think a lot of people especially people who work in fine dining they don't realize the skill sets that you have to have when you work at like a dive bar you have to have really good communication interpersonal skills because yes. you are constant like i always like to say like a dive bar is like 
the comment section in a Facebook chat. Like it is, <laughs> anything can happen. Anything can be thrown at you, and you, you have, you have to be, some stories. Mm-hmm. Oh my you god, you have some stories. <laughs> I think with with dive bars, you have to be more than just the server. You're the mediator. You're the bouncer. You're the comedian. You're 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 everything. You're the managers a lot of times. You're the you therapist. Have to make that decision right there. <laughs> oh yeah. I also worked at a I worked at a on the strip um, at the fashion show mall at the Spanish tapas restaurant. Um, I, I won't name name names, right? But um, <laughs> sure, everyone can figure it out. Um, but that was so that was so much fun and so wild too. So yeah, Vegas Vegas industry folks have such a such a unique experience. Let's. Uh, so you have a book. It's called Tipped. Very important book. I I enjoy the content of it because it's not just about all right uh let's let's help people with their finances you go into anywhere from the mind body and spirit and then you talk a little bit about yourself as well why and self-proclaimed why did you go broke i think that financial literacy is something that needs to be taught and Unfortunately, for a lot of people, we just aren't exposed to that education. It's not taught in most school curriculums. It's often considered a taboo topic. A lot of people don't talk about money. I think even in the industry, while we're really good at talking about how much we make on a shift, like we're really great at having that conversation in the industry, we're not good at continuing the conversation to money management or retirement planning or investing or any of these other things. And so, I think it's 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 almost shameful that we don't mm-hmm. we don't talk about it, and so therefore we can't we can't gauge how we're doing financially because nobody's talking about it. No, I think you're right because a lot of times we do. People ask me, "Oh, how much did you sell, or what what did you make, or what did so and so make?" But we don't talk about uh, what what stocks are we looking at, or yeah, what, what you're doing with your money in general. <laughs> Exactly. Correct. And what you're doing with your money besides buying a video game or mm-hmm. whatever the case may be. What are you doing with it to let it to leverage it, to make it grow, to level it up? Right. We're so quick to talk about the new pair of shoes or, you know, maybe even the flashy car or the vacation, but we're what we fail to talk about is like what percentage of your income is going to your rent? Are you living beyond your means? Are mm-hmm. you setting yourself up for the future because One of the things that's unique to the service industry is that we are the only industry, one, where we are subject to a totally separate minimum wage. Federally, Mm -hmm. we earn $2.13 an hour. And with that type of employment also means that we often don't get benefits. 95% of restaurants and bars and clubs are owned by small independent business owners, which means that they don't have the, the margin or the ability to offer comprehensive employment benefits. And so... We don't get access to a 401k. We don't get access to health insurance. We don't get access to paid time off. You like True. paid time off is one of those things that's like the average nine to fiver gets 20 paid time paid time off days per year. 20 days. Like how much happier, healthier of a human being would you be if you got 20 days a month of working paid time off? True, true. You, yeah. you wonder why our industry, why we're all just like so burnt out to the point of like walking off a job. It's not because we're more irresponsible. It's not because we are moral or ambition failures. It's because our jobs are set up in a very unique way where these benefits are not there. And unfortunately, we have to create them for ourselves. We want PTO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, and you touched upon, before we started uh, recording, you touched upon a mindset that a lot of our industry, our fellow industry people have. Can you tell the audience about the duality and mindset that you find in, in the service industry? Yeah, I think we're a unique industry in that we have a combination of both scarcity and abundance mindset. Where we have abundance mindset is when we are we always assume that there's going to be another shift. We always assume that we can pick up a ship, that we can make some money. And so we may not treat the money that's coming into us with the values that are representative of how we really want to live our life because we're like, oh, there's always going to be more money coming in. I can just spend this money and I can pretend like this money didn't walk into my life. I don't need to to be a good steward over it because 
I got that next shift. And mm-hmm. so we have that <clears throat> abundance mindset, but at the same time, it's also a scarcity mindset because we are spending it before we know how we can utilize it. And we're spending it before it. we get it half the time. Half the time we're spending it before we get it. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we are constantly living in this duality of, of abundance and scarcity and not setting ourselves up for kind of like living in, in, in line with our values. I think what's common in this industry is we often don't know how much we make. Like our True. industry, we're not tracking our income. And people will throw a lot of shade at our industry. Like, oh, you don't even know, you know, you're not, you're not claiming your income. But part of the problem is if, if your job didn't track how much you made, if your business didn't track how much you made or was required by the government, you wouldn't be tracking it either. So, you know, like I think part of the problem with our industry when we don't claim our income is that we don't know how much we make. And so we can't, we don't see it as serious money. We're like, ah, it was just like a $75 shift or a $200 shift, you know? But when you see it in terms of like your annual compensation, you're like, oh shit, that's how much I made? Yeah. And, I ha- and I have nothing left over to show for it? That's when you realize like, oh, there's a lot of potential here. There's a lot of possibility here. And, yeah. and I do make a good income. We don't tend to take accurate inventory. I remember years ago, I was in debt, I was irresponsible, and then I, I forgot the book that I read, but you can't really solve anything that you don't know what is. So I started to track my spending, and absolutely it was a pain in the butt back then because I, I used a lot of cash. And so going through it, I was in the negative every single month. I was spending more than I made, and I did not realize that until I inventoried absolutely. We might think of all our big bills, but we don't, we don't really keep track of the tips that we give out, or we don't keep track of that candy bar that we bought on the way to whatever. But once you add it all up... The, the day-to-day, really the tight. gas, the normal stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the one time you have to you know register your car one time a year, it just kind of seeps in through the cracks. And it was, it was a depressing, sobering moment that I realized that I was going backwards and then I just was able to cut out a lot of things. Yeah, but, tracking's how we, tracking is how we stay honest. We have, a, we have a tendency to lie to ourselves because our brain loves those quick dopamine hits of the, the, of the purchases, of going out for drinks, of grabbing tacos, of like we just, our brains want the quickest and fastest and easiest solution, even if that's not what's best for us long term. You talked a little bit about the bad habits that you learned and how do you get from there to writing a book? What mm-hmm. what happened? What what makes you an expert? Yeah, so 2013 I moved to New York City with my wife with like 700 bucks in our pocket. And I got two jobs. The first job I got was working nights at Coyote Ugly. If you don't know what Coyote Ugly is, I was... Watch the movie! Yeah, you You sing and dance on the bar. You hit your patrons. You get women to take their bras off. It's a damn good time. Um, But so, And then I got a day job working on Wall Street. um, But it was an unregulated market. So it was part trading floor, part independent sales organization, which is essentially like loan sharking, right? Like usurious loan products. It was like the slimy side of financial services. And I we learned- saw that movie too. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And it's really like that. After the third trader got shipped off to rehab, I was like, oh man, I got to go back to construction and bars because this shit is toxic. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, it was The bad. wolf, baby, the wolf. <laughs> <laughs> and so I left there and I got a job. I've also worked in construction for a good part of my, my career, almost in tandem. When I renovated that house okay. that I grew up in, it sort of like gave me a love. So for 20 years, I've been both in the service industry and in construction. But so I got a day job working for the company that I now own. I was employee number three. And the task that they gave me was to set up an HR department and to manage the accounting and finances. And so I had never had HR before, so I didn't know what the hell they did. And so I was constantly researching like, "Mm, what does HR do? What is a paid time off policy? What is health insurance? I think I had had health insurance maybe once in the last 12 years. What is a 401k? So I started to deep dive all of these, these benefits, these resources. And then on the other side, we were working for these really high net worth clients, really, really wealthy people. And I was getting to have daily conversations with them about how they thought about 
money, what they thought about their budgets, their biggest budgets, because we were spending millions and millions of dollars of theirs on these renovations. And so it was both those two, those two parts of seeing like, oh, these systems and benefits are what support somebody's financial life. And it's these financial pillars and mindset, these two things coupled together is how people build wealth. And me and my peers have not had access to any of this. Yeah. And I was just, was just sort of like, this is bullshit. And then in 2016, we all know what was happening politically, but I was just like, I'm out for the media. Like I took off social media, I took off all news. I was just like, I can't stomach this shit anymore. And so I just started listening to personal finance podcasts. And over and over again, I would listen and I would never hear anyone who looked like us. No one who had made their career in the service industry. No one who worked at bars, restaurants, and clubs. And I was like, no one is talking to these people. No one is getting access to these systems. Like there's a reason that our industry has such bad PR and, mm -hmm. and like if, 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 if I'm somebody who's worked in seven different states and all of these careers, if I feel like imposter syndrome to talk about this, then how will anyone ever talk about this? And so I was just like, you know, I, I think I'd listened to another podcast and they were like, write the book you wish you had had. And so that's what okay. this is. This is the yeah. book that I wish I had had 20 years ago because I'd have been retired by now. <laughs> Very nice. That's, uh, I find that to be very important. We do the show because it's important to us to highlight this, sh this uh, service industry as a legitimate way to make a living. So now, push that forward, you are able to, with this book, show people that you can do almost anything. We talk about leveling up, and you talk about being able to improve your financial status. So take us through what you call the- Diversification? Uh, there's diversification, but there's a, a roadmap, is it? Mm-hmm, yep, there's a roadmap. Um, and so each chapter is like a different piece of the roadmap to building yourself to financial freedom. And, and, there, and it's heavy, right? Some of it in our industry is environmental. We work with the general public. We encounter a lot of strange situations. We have to build boundaries. And so I think for me, that's always the first step is understanding your environment, what, your, what the hazards are in your environment and the boundaries that you need to put in place. And maybe that's like, oh, I don't, I don't share my last name or I don't share the street name that I grew up in. I don't show pictures of my kids. I don't, you know, like building yourself boundaries to keep yourself safe so that you can stay in this industry for a long term. Because a lot of people burn out because they don't have proper boundaries in place and they don't understand some of the hazards that come with this job. Hazards are present in every single industry out there. You're never going to have an, a job that doesn't have hazards, but you have to protect yourself against those hazards. Yeah. And so in our industry, I mean, I'm with you. I think that it's an incredible, incredible career that you can have. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential in this industry and we just have bad, bad PR. I look at um, another industry. I like to look at other industries and see similarities. And I recall waste management. It mm -hmm. used to be this like moral and ambition failure if you worked, if you were a garbage man, they were like, oh, don't let your kids grow up to be a garbage man. But you know what? They changed, right? They got benefits. They started paying really well. And now people are like, oh, don't sleep on that garbage job. Like, that, <laughs> it makes so much money. It makes so much money. And they're so done by a certain amount of time. You don't see them collecting garbage at four or five o'clock. No. Mm -hmm. Nope, yeah, they're home done. with their feet up. And <laughs> <laughs> Get, getting paid. Getting <laughs> so paid. I think there's a lot of a lot of potential once people start to see these as legitimate and real careers. And so yeah, the the roadmap is sort of like how to set yourself up with the mindset and boundaries. And then we go into some of the more financial steps mm -hmm. that you can take where it's setting up an emergency fund. An emergency fund is one of my favorite financial pillars because when you are in this industry with the general public, there's often a, an imbalance, right? There's a there's an imbalance and a dynamic where there's there's it, there's a power imbalance, if you will, right? Where okay. you are serving somebody else, and when you have money saved up, there's so many more of those situations that I would have been able to say no to had I had three to six months of savings in in a, in a savings account or in a bucket at home, and I could have just been like, you know what? No, I'm, I'm not willing to do that. And I'm I sorry. think uh, in the book you called it fuck you money. 
It's called Fuck You Money. And it's oh, okay. really, really, really powerful. Um, so that's like one of my favorite steps to talk about. Fun remember- coupons. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it serves as so many things, right? Like I remember the first time I had heard this concept, I was meeting with a financial advisor and he was just like, yep, you need to have six months of cash in an account, not, in, not being invested not saving for a down payment, not for a vacation, just fucking sitting there. And I was like, like rotting. And I was pissed. I was like, this is bullshit. This fucking guy Mm -hmm. doesn't know what he's talking about. And then I spent six months reading every single thing I could about emergency funds. And it was the only thing he told me that was, he was correct on. And it is my favorite thing in the whole wide world. It lets me sleep at night. It helps me know that I've got optionality. It helps me know that like, we're about to go into a recession. Right, we keep seeing all these layoffs and all this stuff. It helps you sleep at night. It's and the book has a lot of fun ways that you can save up for your emergency fund. Like this is what I, I like to bring a lot of like games and whimsy into our jobs. Let's say you're waiting tables and you've got like a five table section. I like to set one of those tables as like that's my savings section. That table is my savings bucket. Like those motherfuckers at that table, they're gonna buy me my freedom. And so like the four other tables that's going towards bills, that's going towards all the other stuff, but that table, whatever I make at that table, that's going into my savings bucket. And so, you know, it it just, you, you treat that table with a little bit of a different regard than you would some of your other tables, maybe. That's true. That's, uh, I like to gamify those things. And one of the things that I, I used to do, I don't do it as much anymore, is I would designate a shift. And this would be my investment shift. So mm-hmm. a per, uh, like every if I or if I picked up a shift, I picked it up with the mindset that whatever I make here isn't for me. Yes. So it, it, it really put like, you know, uh, the, the pop in my step to, to go through it because I know that this has purpose. Yeah, I love investment shifts because I would always remember those people more clearly. I'm like this guy right here, he's going to pay me for his money is going to go to money that pays me every day for the rest of my life. And like, I love that. Right. True. So, True. yeah, that's one of the roadmap steps is uh, saving up for your emergency fund. And then we go into like debt payoff strategies. We go in. We go into budgeting. Budgeting is often a really tough one. That's probably the biggest chapter in the book because we're operating off of a fluctuating income. Right. We can never be sure True. how much we're going to make in a shift and it can make budgeting challenging. So we've got to operate off of like maybe flipping the script, maybe we budget off of our expenses instead of off our income. Maybe we talk about how to build in buffers. Maybe we have some seasonality at play. So there's a lot to consider. You have to be more of a diligent person to budget when you're working on a fluctuating income. It's 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 not necessarily easy, but like you were saying, when you were talking about that time that you tracked it, you don't know until you track. You won't know until you track. So budgeting's a big chapter. And then my favorite chapter is investing in the book because I think as people in the service industry, the general public has that way of like chipping at our confidence, Mm -hmm. right? They'll be like, what's your job? What do you do? You know, like what's your real job? And oh God, right? Like how many times are you asked that fucking question? And so if you understand wine, if you can describe the difference between four reds and four whites or a couple of different kinds, you can understand investing. It is not that complicated. If you can bring in a 10 top on a point of sale system, you can get investing. Um, But my investing chapter is awesome because it's totally analogous to being at a bar. If you understand what it's like to be at a bar, by the end of this chapter, you will understand how to invest. And it's, I like to say this as well, like you can, wine and investing are really similar. You can get way deep into wine. You Mm -hmm. can, you can talk, you can get so deep into wine, right? You can talk about notes and regions and body and flavor and tannins. And, you know, you can, you can go way deep. You can go off the deep end in wine. It's the same with investing. You can go way deep into investing. You can talk about futures and calls and puts and bell curves and, you know, all of those things you can get, but you don't need to get way into wine in order to have a very successful wine experience. Yeah. And investing is the same way. You don't need to know all of those things to get started and to be successful in investing. And so I think for people, sometimes they're just overwhelmed by some of these concepts and they just need to have them broken down into a way that's digestible and understandable and in their world, right? Like it's, it's relatable because it's broken down in this way. 
Yeah, I got a, I got a really great piece of advice when I was in an economics class. One of the people came in, like, he goes, uh, always invest in stuff that you use. You know what I mean? Stuff that you like, stuff that you have in your house, because you use it, you understand it, those kind of things. Why would you invest in something that you don't know what it is or don't, you're going to lose on it? <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah, invest in what you know or invest in the whole market. Just buy a yeah. little piece of everything, right? We have 100 years of data on the stock market. We know that overall, it always goes up. Buy the whole damn market. Buy an index <laughs> fund of the whole damn... I mean, I'm not legally allowed to give financial advice because um, I have zero college and zero credentials and I'm totally self-taught, but um, that's that's what I do. I buy the whole yeah. damn market. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very important, I, I believe, before you start to go on your journey is to go within. And one thing that I do enjoy is that you describe mindset. And it's not just about my, uh, you know, a money mindset. I believe, do you agree that money is connected to your, your emotional history as well? It, it, there's intelligence there that not intelligence in that way, but know how just stuff that you were taught or modeled. And there's also an emotional intelligence that goes along with money. Uh, for me, that was that was it. I was using money or abusing money. And and then the outcome is this financial abuse, basically, or financial ignorance, because I didn't really want to look at, you know, the truth of what I was doing. And once you get to face yourself in those ways and go inward, you can make the decision to, okay, I will start to break down if I was going to buy this, you know, game system or these shoes. How mu- how long would it take me to to buy that or even a car? This might represent a, over a year's salary for me. How can mm-hmm. I justify that? So why don't I just scale back and maybe just buy a used car and I'm, I'm, I'm out the door? Can you speak on, on the emotional aspect or, or maybe some non-financial aspects of dealing with money? Yeah, I mean, I think if you've had any trauma, that trauma is showing up in your financial life, whether you can recognize it or not. A lot of times I'll ask, I do some coaching, so I ask my coaching clients, like, what are your early money memories? What are your first money memories? Like, do you remember your parents arguing about money? Were you were you somebody who had a piggy bank? Like, go deep, go back into childhood because there will be something there that will resonate with how money shows up into your world today. Um, you know, for me, I remember one time losing a hundred dollars, and that was a huge amount of money in our household. And I remember walking for four hours up and down 10 blocks, looking in every bush, in every gutter, trying to find this money, so scared to come home to tell that I had lost this money. Like I was, I was terrified. And I think whatever- Should have been. No, just- right? <laughs> how dare you? However money was shaped for you and how you grew up can show up for you as an adult, right? You were talking about being avoidant with your money. Maybe you wouldn't, and that can show up in a lot of different ways. Like maybe you don't look at your bills, you don't open your mail, you are avoidant to like log in and even check your bank account, whether you have enough money in there or not. Like those traumas, they show up in all ways. Maybe it's, you don't wanna look at those things, but you feel as though you deserve them. You're like, I work hard, I deserve these things, but you haven't dug deep to find out like, what does deserving really mean? Aren't you also deserving of a retirement where, you know, you're standing all these hours. Aren't you deserved of enjoying your golden years, not having to hustle and be on your feet for 30 hours a week? Like, aren't you deserving of your, the problem is we give ourselves these very false trade-offs where we're like, would I rather go out or would I rather not go out? If that's the question, you'd rather go out, right? Would I rather buy this for myself or not buy this for myself? I'd rather buy it for myself. But if we start asking ourselves more intentional questions, like, would I rather, you know, not go out for this, this, and this day, only going out this and this day, and then be able to put some of this into my retirement or into a savings so that I can protect future me? Because future me, the only Wants to go out as well. Yeah, future me (laughs) wants to go out as well. Future me wants a hot tub and a hammock and me is deserving of all those things as well. And guess what? No one else is looking out for future me except me. 
Yeah. The, gover- the government's not. We go back to not claiming our income. Guess what? Social Security is the number one thing that service industry people rely on. Social Security. If you're not claiming your income, then you're not going to be receiving the appropriate amount of benefits. Last mm-hmm. year, or sorry, 2020, the average payout for Social Security was $20,000. And that's for people who fully claimed all of their tips. If you can't imagine living on $20,000 a year, then you're in trouble. And you're yeah. not, as much as you think, I'll just keep working, you're not going to want to work in your 50s, 60s, and 70s. And our lives are just getting longer and longer. So yeah. you got to show up for future you now. I agree with that. I apologize for uh, interrupting you. And you you spoke about language. And language is one of the earliest things that I believe that someone can empower themselves with. And because language ends up changing your mindset. If you're saying, I, uh, I listen to people and they will tell you, what they're feeling emotionally and when you say things like oh i can't afford it or i'm broke and things like that you're really just commanding all those things to be true and instead of saying like you can't afford it it's very important to say things like i can't afford it you can afford almost anything what are you choosing to do and that gives you the important empowerment to say yes i can do this or i can choose to do uh, uh, x or can choose to do y and so language, changing your language and really listening to it, are you really saying that you, you can't afford something? Or are you saying that you're not aware of where you want to put your intentions? Mm-hmm. Yeah, language is, is another resource like money, like time, like energy. It's a resource that we need to use in, in a way that benefits us, right? So yeah, you're not broke, you're getting better with money. You're not, yes. you're not you know, you've started, spend, you've started saving, therefore you are a saver you've started investing therefore you are an investor adopt those identity and use use your language in a way that that will propel you i think for a lot of us right we know people who struggle we all know people who struggle and so sometimes we'll downplay our success or we'll downplay what we're trying to do because we don't want to be seen as somebody who's going to grow out of our circle or grow outside of our industry or grow outside of like we don't want people we don't want in this industry you don't want people to think you're doing well because you don't want people to think you don't need the tips you yeah. don't want people to think that you don't need the shifts you don't want people to think that like your livelihood isn't dependent on it and so i think that's what keeps us a little bit small in our language and in our conversations but we need to be good role models for other people in the industry right we need to be modeling agreed that, yeah we absolutely need be, we need to be modeling that we know our potential, that we know our worth, and that we know that we can we can expand, and that we're deserved of like achieving things like financial freedom and financial independence. I I that that is very well said, and so I really hope those of you are out there are able to dig deep if this content is relevant to you. And Barbara, tell them a- anyone who might be feeling that way, how can they reach you? Yeah, so the book's available on Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> um, right now it's just in uh, Kindle and paperback, but I'm going to try to work on an audio book shortly because I know we all want to do that while we roll our silverware. Um, <laughs> um, and then you can also find me at on all the socials at Tipped Finance. I mostly hang out on Instagram because I like to make memes because I like to make financial stuff pretty fun and funny and approachable. Okay. Um, but you can also reach out to me on www.tipfinance. That's where you can, you know, shoot me a message. Let me know if you had a win. I love to see service industry people win. So, like, I'll be so excited if you're like, I opened up my IRA for the first time or I saved, I'm, I'm on track to save six months. I, oh, my gosh, I will lose my, lose my mind with excitement. <laughs> Um, but I also do one-on-one coaching if that's something you wanted to do. And I will come to your restaurant bar club and do a money talk. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Hit, okay. hit me up. Awesome. I have two and then I'm going to let you go. Uh, what's your favorite system of, of saving? Favorite like, system. for instance, when I first started, uh, I did the envelope system. 
uh, not much of a, a money jar kind of person. I find that the you know you have the envelopes for the you know your car payment or your rent or whatever's aspirational vacation, and you kind of divvy it out. And so I used to do that, or I'd save the change, but it's not really relevant because I don't really get a lot of change anymore. What's what's really topical at the moment for for saving? Yeah, I think if you're somebody who's able to operate within banks and you're able you're you're someone who can be banked um you know i have a bank where i have like six different accounts in one bank and that is how i structured my goals where i was like this account is sort of like my my everything goes into this account right and then i have my account where like i pay myself so that it looks regular Mm -hmm, right it looks like a regular paycheck And then I have this account where I'm like saving for a down payment. I have this account where I'm saving for, you know, this is my emergency fund and my fund. Big girl, they have Mm -hmm. the grown up uh, envelope system. (laughs) Yeah, grown up envelope system. But also, if you're if you're unbanked or you're not able to operate in a banking system, whether you have like levies or garnishment that you know you have creditors after you, like seriously, no shame get on the paper system, right? That's, that works just as well. Like start working with envelopes, start working with, I remember saving for a vacation. I had a cool shoe box. I cut it up. I plastered it with like pictures of the vacation that I was going on and it served as an additional inspiration. Mm-hmm. I, I, I remember I worked at this bar in Boston and um, it was sort of a volume based bar, right? So it was like a lot of churn. And none of the other girls that I worked at worked with cared about change. So at the end of the night, they would just be like, I'm not taking change. I'm not taking change. And I was like, I will take all the change. I will take every yeah. bit of all the change. Oh, yeah. I saved that change for a year. And then I invited all of my coworkers over for like a pizza party and a rolling party. And you would not. Uh, I, you use them. Well, <laughs> $1,200. I was like, this is a very expensive lesson for you. Always take the change. $1,200 wow. from change. That's so. insane. Mm-hmm. That's, I, whenever I used to do the change, I never understood why people would go to a, a change machine and give up a percentage, 10, 15%. I'll just sit there, watch TV and roll it and, mm-hmm. you know, keep all of it. It all adds up. It all adds up. That should be the that should be the title of the show. It all adds up. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> so I'm gonna let you go on this last one. Uh, I know that you point out all the dogs. Which dog would make the best server? Which dog? Yeah, which dog breed would make the best, the best server? Best server. That's so good. Oh my god! I don't even know if I know dog like breed names. I'm trying to think. I mean, I guess fine dining, right? You'd want like a poodle, <laughs> but if you're <laughs> if you're at a dive bar, you like you totally want like a, a bulldog or or a pit bull or something, right? Like I guess true, it's, true. It's, it's location and establishment specific. Danny, I'm, for you? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was trying to think the whole time you guys were talking. I was like, what? <laughs> well, for me, um, it would be a golden retriever. I think aw, they're just universally well-liked, <laughs> you know. But besides the hair getting in everything, I, I think that would be my, uh, you know, personality type. That's that a lot of energy over. coming at you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They, they work that double, no problem. What can I get? What can I get for you? What can I get, what can for, I get you? for you? <laughs> love it, love it. Service on the ball. Thank you so much, Barbara. I do recommend the book. If anyone wants uh, a copy, get it on Amazon, people. <laughs> Sweet, awesome, Marlon, Danny. Thank you so much. No, thank, thank you. you so much. If you have any questions, or or if you want to let me know what your favorite way of budgeting is, mention it in the comments and uh, reach out to Barb. She's on Instagram. Thank you so much. I'm Marlon Joseph, the Modern Waiter. I'm Danny Villa. Subscribe, 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 people. We'll see you next time. Later. Thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>